Well, hello everyone. I'm back to inspire you to want to live. Your life matters. Never give up. Let's win together. My name is Dan Pelly, inspirational speaker for suicide awareness and prevention. And the theme of this video is pain. I'm a two-time attempted suicide survivor. I don't plan on going back a third. And hopefully I can bestow on anybody listening uh, when I'm out speaking that there is a way out. And I made a mistake twice. And the passion for me now is to bestow my experience on other people that I'm living proof that you can live productively, you can be happy. Uh, but there's a lot of factors that go on when we get depressed. Even the medical society realizes there's no magic pill, all right? You know, you're not going to, you know, there's always a combination going on that there's never a magic pill. Although medication can help you and keep you safe, uh, they know each individual is unique from the pain and suffering that they've uh, got involved in. I'm also the founder of the ASPSG group, Attempted Suicide Prevention Survivors Group. Um, and we have a new location January 18th. If you click on the arrow, you can see more information. But the, the more important information there is the hotlines. If you're on edge, you need to call and get yourself some help. So I'm not as much as the medical side. And, and, and you know, there's always ways of recovering. And, and you're going to get help with your doctors and the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the therapists and, and, and the medication and, and all that. That's not my, my, you know, my thing. Although I'm an advocate for it and it helped keep me safe. I'm more about touching someone's heart, and that's where it really matters. And I've talked to medical people about this, that it's the heart that matters. Because when you lose hope, and that last bit of hope just drains out of you, and the pain becomes like an 800-pound gorilla, and it's so excruciating that the, all you are thinking about is ending that pain. And we know many of people, and the suicide rate's going up, and there's plenty of awareness of prevention, and I just feel I have to input my thought of it that what saved my life was hanging on to that little bit of hope and in my heart not being defeated. And, and I will talk about my two attempted uh, suicides where my first attempt, you know, I had the ideology for over a year. Very excruciating, black hole, didn't realize, you know, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't going away, okay? Not washing. Want to stay in bed constantly, not socializing. There's a lot of factors. Biologically, might have run in the family a little bit. I think we all, you know, can be a little crazy in this life, right? We have that in our life. But to be balanced and the way we deal with it and socially, how it's stigmatized, and then spiritually. You don't even have to be a person of faith. Uh, I myself have been a practicing Buddhist for nine years, so it's a lot of self-empowerment there. But I, was, I got better even before I started practicing. It just excelled me into my passion in life and my mission to try to help others. Um, but you don't even have to be a person of faith. But you have to believe in yourself, you know. I think the hardest thing is loving ourselves in this pain. And we think we're worthless and people are better off without us. With my last video, people are better off with you. But this pain, it's so excruciating. And it was so zoned in into that little dark hole it was just relentless and that's what starts my you know started the ideology and it wanted to kill myself and I bought the 250 Tylenol and I bought the bottle of vodka and I went through this pain every day and every day it was the same thing pain after pain after pain and it just kept building and building and building and building and then say screw it I'm going to check out and this went on for about a year for me Okay, and then finding that hotel, doesn't matter which one, uh, I wouldn't name it anyway, but going into the room, sitting there, and wanting to end it over loss, business loss, heartbreak, whatever causes you to get there, my depression became clinical. And when it becomes clinical, that's when you become very dangerous to yourself and you're going to need help. Right? You're not going to do this alone. You're not going to will it away. You're not going to sleep it away. Unless you've got the means to stay in bed for 30 years, you know, that's going to be your choice. You know, we do have a choice. But I want to touch that person's heart. It's the heart that matters and the hope that matters that it's going to get you out of this situation. 
with the combination of the right therapists and doctors, some great people out there. I didn't have the right ones all the time. Uh, I moved away. I read a story about a, a, a person that was misdiagnosed and uh, was giving them too much medication. Not about the kids that, you know, I mean, anybody can get a reaction from medication, but they were just pumping this person, you know, with it. So taking a civil lawsuit out. And civil lawsuits can be, you know, painful on themselves where, uh, you know, that's coming down the road for, for that person, okay? But besides that, I, I, I encourage a person to do that. You can't, you got to have justice too, right? You can't let people just do that and get away with uh, hurting you, okay? It just doesn't work that way. But uh, that's a different kind of pain. Uh, but the pain I'm talking about is mentally, that causes mental anguish and physical, and it just, body aches, you don't want to move, you're, you're hallucinating, you're delusional, you have all these things going on to the point where it gets, you want to end it. And that's where I was when I went in that hotel room and I put the 250 Tylenols up there in the vodka and I said, this is it. And I contemplated for six hours, writing notes. I love you, my family, my, my son, please forgive me, this pain is just relentless, I can't get out of it, and if I knew what I knew now, I would have sought help a lot quicker, and although it wasn't an abundance years back, there's more of it now, although the suicide rate's going up, I believe we are saving lives out there, and I'm an advocate for it, uh, but as I sat there, and that pain was just so overwhelming. And it didn't have anything to do about being strong or pulling yourself up by the bootstraps or anything that was going on. It was just the pain, you know. So I talk to people about this and, and they say, well, people, you know, chicken way out and, they, you know, they cop out and all that. I, I, I never even thought of that when I was sitting there. You know, ending your life, it, it, it's not easy. You know, it's a very excruciating, painful Nobody cares, and, and if you told somebody, if you were, like I was walking in a hotel room and said, hey, I got 250 Tylenol, I'm thinking about killing myself, they would react and call the, for, for, for police. People do care, you know, people are humane, you know, there's a lot of humanity out there. But if you're not speaking up and you're not having dialogue, you end up being alone. And this is the problem with the stigma of being alone, that, that people don't go out and, uh, you know, for advocating or support groups or... You know, things and that. That's why I wanted this attempted suicide group. I know it's not easy to come up, but they have dialogue one on one and really talk about recovery because um, we can have all the awareness of prevention in the world, but if we're not touching that person that's behind closed doors and that's suffering and that wants to take their life in pain, it just is you're not going to help yourself. But as I started ingesting these 250 Tylenol and I got them all down, figuring I'm going to end my life and lay down, and it was just the most excruciating thing I've ever been through or the pain that I was through this and the pain and the pain and the pain. And I woke up six hours later, green, red eyed, just terribly look, terrible looking. And it was, it was the worst feeling. And I figured if I go back to sleep, I would end it. And here's the, 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 the switch. And the, you know, when things switch off in your mind, when, when I finally woke up again and said, I, I can't even get this right, you know, never mind the, some things that happen in your life, right? And breakups or whatever it is. And I went to the hospital and I never realized that I would have that much of a turnaround that I wanted to live when they told me they're going to try to save my life. My kidneys will break down, my liver, dialysis everything. I never wanted to live so bad in my life. Even when I was doing good and never had depression. Like I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. You know? And it was just it was just the the oddest thing because you're you're in so much pain. So you hopefully you're not successful or you don't even attempt in knowing that you could be, you know, on the other side. Just want to check my time here, see how we're doing. Yeah, it's about nine, ten minutes. Um so the doctor's like, you know, he was pissed off because he was like, you know, hey, we're trying to save life. You're trying to take your life. And I'm like, no, I want to live. I want to live. I made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. You know, and there I was. 
three days in IC unit, got to the point where my blood levels went up to a point where they said, your kidney's going to break down, your liver's going to break down, you need to call family. Whatever I was doing at the time and uh, praying, I was, I was a, um, you know, Catholic at the time and now I'm a Buddhist, but I did both uh, from a friend that I know in the Buddhism. And just wanting to live, the will to live. And, and they just said, this is it for you. You know, you're not going to make it. So the next morning after three days, um, they're all standing over me. And they were amazed that I was still alive. And uh, they said, your levels actually went to normal. And were just totally, we have no explanation for you, Dan. <laughs> and I just felt so vindicated that I wasn't successful. Not that I didn't attempt years later in a second attempt that wasn't as serious because this is the problem, you know, we can slip back into a depression. And, uh, but I survived and I, and I made a vow never to do it again, but you never can say never because illness can always come back and, and, and bite you. So, um, you know, then 14 years later at the family and raising beautiful kids and giving them a good life and. My stepdaughter had a, a serious accident I love dearly, and the, and the kids are growing up to be uh, young men, and two young men, and my son, and, and my grandkids. Um, but it really spiritually broke me about her getting hurt, although she's doing well now, but she suffers a brain injury. You know, I got depressed again, and I was 14 years later, and I'm in bed again for 10 months, and my wife's like, you gotta get up, you gotta clean yourself up, you gotta get back to life, and... It's like, no, just leave me alone, leave me alone, the pain's excruciating. So I made an attempt, uh, took way too many Ativans, had to get my stomach pumped, and, you know, this was in 2010, and uh, I just felt like the biggest asshole of my, for myself, like, how could you even do this again? And again, it was the pain, you know, like, it's like blinders, man, it's just, the pain is just so, and people know what I'm talking about that are suffering. The pain is so excruciating. And then I realized it's time to recover for good, Dan. And I was on three or four or five medications, and it was it was just really difficult. And uh, But I made a vow to be off medications in a year. I, I got the right doctor. I got the right therapist. I got on the right meds after a combination. Got to the right recovery program. But then it was more the physical, eating well, sleeping well, taking care of myself. Uh, I did start, you know, practicing Buddhism, um, you know, to inspire myself, you know, to really give yourself that strength in your heart, because when you're sitting alone, it's your heart that matters and, and the hope that you need to have for yourself. And I started moving upwards in my life condition, and I'm med-free today after six or seven years. But we all can get to that pain. It's That's when we got to reach out for help. Other people that are trying to help you and love you and care for you, and you have to reach out. So um, just want to thank everybody for all the likes and the subscribes and uh, the shares. And uh, I want to leave you with some uh, quotes that I have here that I think will be inspiring. But, uh, you know, we have this issue of, um, you know, a hard shell of our lesser self. You know, we really get down on ourselves and our self-centeredness and we have to open up to ourselves and other people. And this that hope to live, you know, the darker the night, the nearer the dawn, the greater our suffering, the happier we'll become, you know, I'm happy today. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll read a quote, a quote that I, inspiration I got through my Buddhism, but it's just so true how we have to live our life every day. Unhindered by the past, we can actively transform our future in any way we wish through our single minded determination at this moment in taking concrete action. Faith is like a lighthouse that illuminates, illuminates the path to happiness from the past to the present and the present into the future. Life is a never finished product. There is no stagnation. Every day we advance or retreat, improve ourselves or degrade ourselves. And we know about that, we're in a suicide state. To live means to constantly change, a continual process of construction towards the goal of perfection. Until the last moment of life in this world, let us live each day burning with the flame of advancement and improvement. You know, your life matters, and you can get better, but you're not going to do it laying in bed. You're not going to do it 
lamenting over your pain. Yeah, you tell people I'm sick. I told people, yeah, I'm sick, but I'm not going to stay this way forever. I'm not like got a black mark on me because I try to commit suicide. And this is why I'm out speaking about it because, and other people that have spoke about it, and I commend them because it takes a lot of courage to get out here and let's end the stigma, you know, that's really keeping people in isolation that don't want to go out to the suicide events. And, you know, do we, how do we get to those persons so there's not a lot of people left bereaving, right? So this pain is something we can recover from. So we can go from the pain to the recovery to happiness. And I just wanted to bestow that on you that don't give up on yourself. You know, you really matter. In your darkest moment, know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And just hold on. Just hold on just a little longer. It would really... You have so much to live for. You know, you might not think that now. I thought I could never live for anything. But you can. And you'll have a life. And you'll be happy. The last thing I'm going to quote from uh, the great Mandela declared about this and we know he spent 26 years in prison because it doesn't get any more painful than that uh, and I'll end with it as long as we are alive there is hope hope vanishes only when we give up on ourselves so don't give up on yourself sufferings are a springboard for growth if you feel no hope then you create it you create it yourself you find it Mr. Mandela declared we should all bear in mind that the greatest glory of living Lies not in never feeling, but in rising every time you fall. And I'm living proof that you can rise above this and you can live a productive life. Your life matters. You have to want to live. Never give up. Let's win together. My name is Dan Pelly, inspirational speaker. And I'll see you next month. You hold on. And you get better, and you can live a productive life, and you can be happy. Ciao.